My name's Kevin. We're a non-profit organisation that invites academics, journalists, authors and experts from around the UK and beyond to present talks on a wide range of fascinating and intriguing topics that we'll hope you'll find entertaining as well as challenging. You can find out more about what we do at our website. We have a Facebook page, Eventbrite page and Meetup pages. Just search for Bright Think and that's with one T. Very clever to see what we did there. One T in the middle, some people can't find it, but you will eventually. Uh, I'll just give you a quick rundown of the evening. Uh, our Bright Talks last about 45 minutes, our max, something like that. Uh, we, will, we won't do an interval tonight, we'll just go straight into the Q&A. Uh, there's no audio recording or filming permitted during our events other than what we have at front here. Uh, and usually I don't need to say this, but and you all look like a lovely bunch of people, but it bears mentioning, anyone who intentionally disrupts our events or poses a threat to our guest, speaker, or audience members will be asked to leave the event or escorted from the premises. So, on that note, to our talk. Um, maybe most of you in here will have heard what this talk is about, Scientology. Some of you might never have heard of it before. Uh, if you've heard of Dianetics, um, if you've seen Tom Cruise going crazy on Oprah's sofa, uh, or if you've heard of the great Xenu, the intergalactic emperor, then you've probably heard of Scientology. Um, we do have our neighbours in East Grinstead, just up the road. That's one of their major headquarters at St Hill. Uh, and they also have an active operation here in Brighton. You may have seen them doing their free personality tests at Churchill Square, I haven't seen any recently, but they also do a wonderful thing called, what was it called, the uh, the tent, it appears, it travels around the world, around the world, it appeared on our seafront, oh I think pre-Covid now, and it's called uh, Psychiatry and Industry of Death, and it's a weird and wonderful tent, it's like a travelling weird circus, it's definitely <laughs> like if, you, if it ever passes through your way. Um, Unbeknownst to me, the first time I encountered Scientology was reading the works of its founder, L. Ron Hubbard. And this was years ago when I was a lot younger and I read his <clears throat> ten-volume opus called Mission Earth. Uh, I don't know whether anyone's ever heard of that. You might have seen the wonderful film with John Travolta in. Um, he's a Scientologist as well. But uh, it's all quite painful. Uh, the New York Times reviewed the books as paralyzingly slow-moving adventure enlivened by interludes of kinky sex, send-ups of effeminate homosexuals, and the disregard of conventional grammar so global as to, as to suggest a satire on the possibility of communication through language. So I wouldn't recommend reading it. <laughs> uh, I would recommend two other books that I bought when I was uh, a bit younger and I got interested in it. They were hard to find at the time, but I think they've been re-released in paperback. One is Barefaced Messiah by Russell Miller, which is a biography on Alan Hubbard. And then there's a piece of Blue Sky by John Attack, which I think got recently published in 2013. They're worth checking out. Anyway, suffice to say, it's a subject that's fascinated me for a while now, and I think we're up for a very fascinating and intriguing evening. So, without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our guest speaker for tonight, Mr. Alex Palms Ross. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, thanks everyone. Can we all hear me okay? Yeah, lovely. I've not given a talk before, so please bear with me because I don't really know what I'm doing, but I'll do my best. Um, so my name's Alexander Barnes-Ross and I'm a potential trouble source. Um, now, I have to preface this with a warning. According to the Church of Scientology, I'm a butthurt, anti-religious bigot that's part of a hate group and I'm attempting to exploit my few weeks of participation in the church. It's up to you to decide whether you agree with this or not, but I'm not being paid to give this talk, um, and I'm happy, more than happy to show anyone and everyone the certificates and proof of the fact that my time was about five years in Scientology. As for being butthurt, I declined to comment. <laughs> when I was 15 years old, like most teenagers do at one point or another, um, I was asking myself the big questions. Where am I going in life? What did I want to do? Who am I? And who do I want to be? Unfortunately for me, I stumbled across this. You are not your name. 
You're not your job. You're not the clothes you wear or the neighborhood you live in. You're not your fears, your failures, or your past. You are hope. You are imagination. You are the power to change, to create, and to grow. You are a spirit that will never die. And no matter how beaten down, you will rise again. Scientology. Know yourself. Know life. Yes, I still know the words of that off by heart. Um, as I'm sure you can imagine, uh, that caught my attention. Uh, what is this thing? It certainly looks promising. Could it help me understand life? It's shiny cars, wistful eyes, and roast beef for dinner. It's chaos and harmony and water balloon fights and words you can't take back. It's tears of joy and pain and feelings you can't explain. It's questions and answers and I don't knows. It's the rise and fall of civilizations and stock markets and kids on trampolines. It's finding true love and losing it and finding it all over again. It's music and sensation and touchdowns and chocolate. It's spirituality and inspiration and money and traffic jams. It's disaster and heroism and paper clips and knowing when to breathe. It's flirting and tasting and curiosity. It's fast and it's slow and it's rising and falling. It's every moment, every hope, every dream, every piece of the cosmic puzzle. It's life and it's yours. Scientology. Know yourself. Know life. Yeah, we get it. Thank you. <laughs> uh, let's move back to that one. Uh, this was me uh, when I first joined, by the way. I was 15 years old. It's a picture of me. Just to give some context of uh, my age. Um, so I remember as a kid, the grown ups used to tell me off for asking why too much. Alex, do your shoelaces up. Why? Well, because, you know, you'll trip over and then you'll hurt yourself. Alex, finish your dinner. Why? So that you don't get hungry later. I didn't like being told what to do. I wanted to understand the reason so that I'll be more, knowledge more knowledgeable about, well, life. I certainly had a lot of questions and blind obedience certainly wasn't in my DNA. And yet, little did I know, I would one day be signing a one billion year contract dedicating my life to perhaps the world's most well-known high control group. This is the story of how I went from impressionable young teenager, you just saw on the screen, to top cult recruiter. And then what led me to be standing here in front of you guys today, the Scientology's number one UK enemy. I hope your seatbelts are strapped in and fastened because we're about to go for a ride. Are you ready? <laughs> yeah, alrighty. Uh, so growing around a lot, I, growing up, I moved around a lot. I went to five different schools, moving from a town in South Essex to a village in the middle of buttfuck nowhere when I was seven years old, and then to London at the age of 14. By the age of 21, I hadn't lived anywhere or known anybody, apart from my family, for more than about seven years. Nowadays, seven years goes by in a flash, but as a kid during your formative years, that's a big deal. But fuck nowhere is where I will always call home. More specifically, it was a typical British countryside village in Essex, on the Essex-Suffolk border to be specific, called Great Yeldon. It was the sort of place where, as a kid, you were free to explore to your heart's content, building dens in the woods, and making as much noise as you wanted, knowing there were no neighbours for miles around. The nearest town was a 20 minute drive away, um, and there were no more than about 70 pupils in my entire primary school. When I got to secondary school, it was literally next to a castle. Oh, and fields, lots of fields. I, li I like fields. Uh, it was idyllic and the perfect place to grow up. Carefree and bliss. So far, so good, right? By the time I started secondary school, I was starting to feel settled. I had friends, I had a routine. Facebook had just started to take over from MSN Messenger. 
But life suddenly got turned upside down when three boys from my school, Chris, Danny and Rick, tragically died after hitting a tree in a car accident. I wasn't particularly close to them, but I sat next to Danny's brother in one of my classes and their loss was felt by the whole school. About a year later, the school's atmosphere was just about back to normal. Danny's brother was back in class after taking some time off to grieve. We were now in year eight, fully accustomed to high school life. When suddenly another tragedy hit. A boy named Andy, who was in the year above, had chosen to end his life after suffering in silence for an extended period of time. No one even knew that he was struggling. I didn't know Andy, but again, another tragic death sent shockwaves through my school. And once again, we all felt the pain together. Over the course of the next year, our entire school came close together to try and support each other. And it was starting to feel like we were one giant family healing together and trying to focus on living life to the fullest. At the very least, we wanted to make Chris, Danny, Rick and Andy proud. So we moved up into year nine. And this is where things were starting to get serious because by the end of that year, we had to decide on which subjects to choose for our GCSEs. A choice which would impact what A-levels we were going to take and what ultimately what degree we would be eligible for. And then on October 23rd, 2008, my friend Maggie, who was just 14, passed away after a short battle with stomach cancer. I still miss her to this day. Throughout this period, my mum had gotten a new job in London and was driving two hours to work each way, leaving before I woke up to go to school and not getting home until 8 p.m. I was responsible for getting myself ready for school, making sure I did my homework, cooking my own dinner. With barely any parental supervision and the unusual frequency of tragic losses, I learned to grow up fast. Two months after Maggie's death, my mum decided we needed to move to London to cut down on her commute so we could spend more time together. And shortly afterwards, we were in a new home and I was back where I had been only seven years earlier. Starting a new school in an unfamiliar place midway through the school year and playing catch up on all fronts. Only this time I had to put on a brave face and make new friends while struggling internally with the emotional whirlwind of the last few years. Fast forward two years later and I was finishing my GCSEs, having put my emotions on hold to focus on my studies. I finally had the mental headspace to start processing what the fuck just happened and why I felt just empty. And then I saw this. We're all looking for it. Some of us have been looking our whole lives. Some think they can buy it. Some think they can wear it. Some travel the world in search of it. Most don't even know what they're looking for. But we all feel it. That aching desire. That unexplainable emptiness. That can only be filled by one thing. The truth. Scientology. Know yourself. Yeah, know yourself, know life. No. Thank you very much. Uh, so sign me up, take my money, right? You can see why this sort of thing was appealing to me at that point in my life. I just shared some pretty depressing shit with you and I want to highlight that it's not because I want your sympathy or I want to pull on your heartstrings, but I just want to demonstrate how anybody can find themselves in a situation through no fault of their own where they're vulnerable, whether it be through trauma, loss, grief, or a momentary upset in life. Scientology recruitment tactics are designed specifically to prey upon these vulnerabilities, and this is how they get people in, which I'd know too well because I ended up being a recruiter for Scientology. 
Now, I've always considered myself somewhat of a critical thinker, and even at the age of 15, I understood the value of researching alternative viewpoints. So naturally, I spent a lot of time Googling Scientology and trying to gain a better understanding of exactly what this thing was that had managed to touch my deepest nerve in three simple video clips. Although there were, of course, various stories of abuse online at the time, they all seemed to be from high-ranking executives in upper-level management over in America, and there were certainly no individuals from the UK, and there were only a handful of people who were speaking out at the time. In my head, I considered the possibility that perhaps there was some you know, corruption or something at the top level of the organisation of their structure, and some people had had a terrible experience, but ultimately I couldn't find a single story of abuse, harm or anything like that from an average Joe parishioner who wasn't working for the church. And like I said, absolutely nothing from the UK. I know now that the Church of Scientology operates a thorough, determined and at the time very effective propaganda machine. And back then OSA, Scientology's Office of Special Affairs, had a much firmer grip on the internet than it does now. For context, by then it was 2011, Twitter had only just become popular, people browsed the internet on Blackberries, and only 15% of homes in the UK were hooked up to Virgin Media's super fast broadband, which was 25 megabytes a second. Now, I did stumble across a 2008 BBC Panorama documentary about Scientology, in which John Sweeney, I'm sure many of you here would have seen this, um, but for those of you who don't know, John Sweeney famously loses it and he's seen on camera screaming at church PR rep Tommy Davis in his face. The film was a follow-up to an earlier Panorama documentary, which was an investigation into Scientology, and I hadn't seen the first one. The second one which I had seen was focused more on the fair game tactics of harassment. It didn't actually explain what Scientology was. Church, spoke people, church spokespeople vehemently defended their faith with conviction. They were clearly set on shutting down anyone that questioned their beliefs. And true to my nature, my first thought was why? I'm just going to play this short clip of John Sweeney for those of you who haven't seen it. I'm not an expert on brainwashing. And when asked in that case why he kept making the accusation, Sweeney's reaction was unexpected to say the least. Did you understand? You are quoting the second half of the interview, not the first half. You cannot understand what. <laughs> John Sweeney, everybody. <laughs> so when I saw that as a young teenager, I saw a journalist that was presenting this show behaving like this, and I immediately questioned the integrity and impartiality of the documentary, <coughs> as one naturally would. Was Scientology really that bad? Or was just John Sweeney deliberately attempting to make it look bad out of spite or for revenge? Now, I just want to throw in here very briefly that I've since met John Sweeney. I now, considering him a, now consider him a good friend, and he's actually a really lovely guy. And now I know why he did this, because I understand the tactics that were used to make him do that. And I still, to this day, could get anyone to do that that I wanted to, but I'm not going to, because I'm not a Scientologist anymore. Um, now remember, I was 15 years old and had been gripped by Scientology's propaganda machine. The videos I played earlier, I'm just going to show this as well for context, I was 15 years old. The videos I play, played you earlier had struck a chord. Well, as a logical next step, I thought I'd go in and find out for myself what harm was there in walking into a church, paying them a visit and asking some questions perhaps do a personality test and mulling it over for a few days. So I decided to walk into their London organisation and see firsthand what it's like so that I can make up my own mind rather than taking the media's word for it. It turns out that was a mistake. Uh, don't do it. <laughs> uh, something a lot of people find hard to understand is how Scientology's manipulation and coercion actually works. 
No one locks you in a room or forces you to sign a one billion year contract on day one. No one joins a cult, right? So from the offset, everybody comes across as reasonable, friendly, and well-intentioned. And to be fair, I still believe that most Scientologists are. Of course, there are predators, there are abusers, and criminals in Scientology. But the majority of Scientologists, as I once was, genuinely believe that they are doing good work and helping people. I gave them a tough time. I didn't walk in and accept everything that they said to me at face value. I challenged them on everything. I'll give you an example, disconnection. I asked, I hear Scientology tears families apart and forces people to disconnect from one another. This is the answer I got. Well, think of it this way. It's not quite like that. If you were at school, for example, which I was, they were relating it to my personal experience, and someone was bullying you, you would naturally not want to spend time with that person. You wouldn't sit with them at lunch. You wouldn't contact them. You'd kind of ignore them. You'd cut them out of your life. That's exactly what disconnection is. You'd naturally distance yourself from them. Disconnection is the term that Elrond Hubbard came up with for this phenomena. If someone is getting in the way of your spiritual growth or trying to put you down or stop you from achieving, you would cut ties with that person. It's always an individual's choice. We would never force someone to disconnect from a family member. That response sounded fairly reasonable, but what I would later find out is the words my recruiter had chosen were somewhat crafty because sure, no one ever explicitly forces you to disconnect from somebody, but let's put this into context. You're a Scientologist and you have been for your whole life. Your family, your wife or husband and your kids are all in Scientology. Your partner decides to leave and wants to speak out against Scientology. Well, now you have a choice to make. You don't have to disconnect, but you're not allowed to progress in Scientology because if you're connected to an enemy, that's gonna get in the way. You're a suppressive person, or your partner is. So if you don't disconnect, you'll be declared a suppressive person yourself, which means your kids and family will have to disconnect from you. So it's completely your choice. You don't have to disconnect, but which do you choose? Your family and kids and the faith you've grown up believing or your partner who's left Scientology. So when the recruiter told me no one forces you to disconnect, technically this is kind of true, but it's certainly coerced and in practice disconnection is a harmful practice that creates a lot of pain and suffering for people all over the world. Over time, as I did more and more courses and learned more about Scientology, my experience looked drastically different to how it had been perceived in the media. I had not been abused, I'd not seen anyone forced to do something they didn't want to do, no one has tried to lock me in a room or force me to disconnect. So this furthered the cognitive dissonance in my mind. I'd learned a few things on the life improvement courses that I'd done, you know, I'd completed them, everybody in the org was young and friendly and had a shared goal of helping people. It's just fueled this doubt in my mind that everything that these people were saying in the media maybe isn't quite true. It's not quite as bad as maybe it seems. Before long, I joined staff and after finishing my GCSEs, I thought there was no harm in uh, spending a little bit more time over my summer break, volunteering my time and having fun with my new friends who were only a year or two older than me selling books. We would go out and offer stress tests on the street of Lund streets of London, which you guys probably have seen just down the road in Churchill Square. We'd hang out in the sunshine, setting up booths on the side of the road and sell Dianetics, promising change in people's lives. I was eventually promoted to director of public book sales, which meant recruitment was my number one responsibility. Scientology policy actually dictates that you have to invade someone's privacy in order to sell them a book. Your goal as a bookseller is to find someone's ruin. That's the thing that is upsetting someone the most or causing the most uh, you know, distress in their life. 
Uh, in order to do this, uh, you need to ask them some really personal questions. And yes, this means invading someone's privacy. But as a Scientologist, it was justified. Doing so is for the greatest good, the greatest number of dynamics. Because by finding out what is ruining this person's life, I can show them how Dianetics can help them resolve that issue. We used to have a saying in London Org, crying is buying. If I can get you to cry, you're buying the book because I've found out what it is that's causing you the most stress or pain or upset in your life. So therefore, it's easy for me to present Dianetics as a solution to that. I didn't realize at the time that it's never appropriate to intentionally make someone cry. Asking personal pointed questions and getting someone to relive their trauma is a horrible thing to do. Even if I justified it in my mind, as a necessary evil to help this person. This is one of the many heavy burdens I now carry and think about daily. I was their number one bookseller, and at one point, Scientology leader Dave Miscavige, also known as chairman of the board, sent a film crew from Los Angeles to London to capture the amazing work of this hotshot new bookseller in London, so they could put it in a Scientology promo piece and play it at one of their big international events. There are undoubtedly people who are currently Scientologists because I recruited them. And although at the time I thought I was helping them, if there is any chance I had, sorry, let me start again. <laughs> although I thought I was helping them, uh, there is every chance they have now been abused or traumatized or harmed as a result of me recruiting them. Coming to terms with this is very hard. And one of the reasons I feel it's not just important, but it's my duty to do the work I now do in speaking out. I helped people get into Scientology. Now I want to help people get out. In fact, just the other week, I was protesting outside London Org and I saw somebody on staff in the uniform that I had recruited 10 years ago. Imagine how much of a mindfuck that was. So why did I leave? I was upset about something and had been given an auditing session to try and resolve this issue. Um, and I came out feeling worse. I was crying, I was upset. Um, so I kicked up a bit of a fuss as a, a teenager that didn't like to be told no. Um, I was asking for more help because applying Scientology hadn't worked in this instance. In Scientology, the belief is that the tech, they call it technology, um, works 100% of the time, if it's applied correctly, with no exceptions. So if you find yourself upset or complaining about it and not working, it's because you've done something to cause that situation, not because the tech itself is bollocks. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the most basic principles in Scientology is that you are an immortal spiritual being. You've lived for thousands, if not millions of lives, and you will live for thousands, if not millions more. They call this a Thetan. So you as a Thetan are innately godlike. You have more power, more ability, more control than you could possibly imagine. And Scientology is going to help you unlock those long lost spiritual powers. Great. Sounds good, right? Sign me up. Yeah. Well, the flip side of this is, well, if you're ultimately in control of your environment and your life, when things don't go right, that's because you've done something to put yourself in that situation. So when American actor Danny Masterson drugged and violently raped several women in the early 2000s, and they reported what had happened to them to their ethics officer at the Celebrity Center, instead of sympathy and support, they were asked, what did you do to pull it in? Because whether it was intentional or not, they had put themselves in a situation where they had allowed that to happen to them. Yes, it's a horrible thing to have happened, but why would you let that happen to yourself as a Thetan? That is why I believe that it's not just a case of staff members being abused by David Miscavige, but the practice of Scientology is in and of itself harmful. When I complained that I was upset, I was locked in a room by my ethics officer and told that I couldn't leave until I'd written down everything that I'd done wrong against the church. 
crying. I got up to leave. He put his hand on the door handle and he locked it. He said, you can't leave. Eventually, I was escorted to the desk and then the door and I was declared a potential trouble source and not to be trusted. For a while, I fought for a review and that for them to reconsider. Scientology was everything to me, right? It was my purpose in life. I had signed a one billion year contract, ready to join the elite sea organization, move to Florida and spend the rest of not just this life, but all of my future lives working for the church. But eventually I gradually drifted away. And when you're not in that environment all day, every day, and being constantly indoctrinated, I slowly started to find a new path in life. I went to university, got a job, Ultimately, my childhood and teenage years were pretty traumatic. And now, having felt like I'd lost everything yet again, I put it all into a box in my mind and tried to move on and not think about it too much. A lot of my friends never even knew that I was in Scientology. There are some of you in the audience today that I've known for almost a decade. Some of whom I met just weeks after being kicked out. And this is the first time that they've heard me talk about this. Because it had taken a lot of time for me to not only process what happened to me, but for myself to understand it and then find the confidence to speak out. The catalyst for me was about 18 months ago when I was in a pub with a friend and we'd had a disagreement. In Scientology, you're taught that you have a reactive mind and an analytical mind. And when somebody's angry or upset, they're not thinking rationally. It had been years since I last set foot in a church of Scientology, but I noticed in that moment that without realizing it, I was applying a Scientology technique. I wasn't listening to his concerns or giving credit to his feelings. Rather, I was trying to manipulate his emotions because I was thinking subconsciously that we won't be able to resolve this while you're not thinking rationally. I don't know what clicked in my brain, but it was that moment that I realised Scientology runs deep and even though I didn't believe in it anymore, I was subconsciously still doing it. My therapist later explained to me that as a teenager, you're still forming your neural pathways and as such, even a short time in a high control group at that age does much greater long term damage than if you were, for example, joining in your 20s or 30s. It hit me like a ton of bricks and one night in January 2022, I ended up in hospital after taking about 20 sleeping tablets. It was all too much to take and I just wanted it to end. This wouldn't have happened if I hadn't have been in Scientology. And I feel lucky to be in a place now where I can stand here today and tell you all my story. My time in Scientology was traumatic, yes. And on several occasions it got dark, real dark. But my story is not the only one, and sadly, it's far from the worst. In fact, I had it quite lightly. In the aftermath of my attempted suicide, I found the courage to Google Scientology for the first time in a decade. I started to read about other people's experiences. At the international base in California, for example, dozens of people who I'm now privileged to call my friends tell their stories of being physically beaten by Dave Miscavige, being forced to have abortions, put on hard manual labour and interrogated for hours on end. And there are people here in the UK who I now know who have found the courage decades later to share their story of how they were raped and abused as a teenager in East Grinstead just up the road. Unfortunately, dozens more of these stories exist. And the more I read, the more I felt compelled to do something about it. I can't save the world or take on a multi-billion dollar cult by myself, but if I have a fleeting opportunity to raise awareness about the abuse people are experiencing right here, right now in Scientology, I'm gonna take it. Since 1959, Scientology has had a large compound and headquarters at St. Hill Manor, just up the road in East Grinstead, as Kev mentioned earlier. I recently called out the mayor of East Grinstead for attending Scientology events, 
he went to nine events last year, trussed up on stage, his little mayor belt thing on, talked on stage, took a £50,000 cheque for his charity. I called him out on it. And the response that I got uh, was the council issuing a formal statement on letterheaded paper labelling me a bully. They asked me to refrain from speaking out about it on social media, and this response only furthered my concerns that Scientology have managed to infiltrate and strengthen their influence over local government. It also turns out that local MP Mims Davies even awarded St Hill a Covid Heroes Award for their community work during the pandemic. Staff at St Hill are not allowed to leave the property without permission. They're paid £50 a week to work 12, 14 hour days, seven days a week with no time off. They are, for all intents and purposes, modern slaves. And yet the local MP is awarding them for their community work and the mayor is accepting big checks. The deeper I dig, the more atrocious it becomes. And the more I was inspired to use my voice to stop the enabling of this abuse that's happening every single day right here in Sussex. I now speak out on YouTube under the name Apostate Alex, which I showed on the screen earlier. And I have a blog called Scientology Business where I talk about Scientology's fraud, financial and legal affairs. Over a thousand attempts are made every single day to hack into my website. I'm followed by private investigators. I wouldn't be surprised if there's one of you in the audience today. I did give you the heads up if you're a PI or Scientology spy, let me know beforehand because I'll cover your door fee, but no one's come forward just yet. Um, Scientology have released statements in the press labeling me a butthurt, anti-religious bigot. I've been told by insiders currently in Scientology that I'm considered public enemy number one in the UK. Scientology's Office of Special Affairs are doing everything and anything they can to stop me from speaking out. But fuck them. While I've got the chance, I'm going to do everything I can to raise the alarm and support the people who are currently in and want to escape. I'm only just at the start of my journey, but if there's one thing Scientology got right, it was identifying me as a potential trouble source. Thank you. Thank you very right? much. It's all right. That was wonderful. Um, so we'll go straight to the Q&A this evening. Uh, we usually have an interval, but we're just going to go straight in. Um, just a few rules. Those of you who come every week will know them, but they bear repeating. It's the Bright Think 3Bs. Be concise. Be polite. Be a question. <laughs> it sounds simple, but... Practically every time we do it, someone still fails. So, <laughs> let's see how we do this evening. But, uh, so I'm going to open up the floor. It's a rhyming mic, so if you do have a question, hold up your hand, I'll come around with the mic, and then I'll take it and we'll pass it on. So treat it like a therapy pillow if you don't have the mic. You don't get to talk. <laughs> so do we have any questions? We've got one down here. Yes, please. Okay. Alex. Yes, I'd be really give it to me. To know um, what impact this has had on your mental health? Um, mm. Not not what impact Scientology has had on your mental health, mm. but the helping of people has had on yeah. your mental health. Yeah, that's a great question. I think. It's been interesting because I, I found like a community of people that I didn't know existed. You know, when I joined Scientology, I was looking for answers. I was, you know, swept under the kind of guise of we're all here trying to do the same thing, trying to help people. And, you know, this is why I'm here. And it kind of filled that part of my life. And when I came out and started speaking out and I met all these other people who are speaking out and trying to take on this fight and take down Scientology, again, I felt that sense of like belonging and felt like a bit of a purpose again, which I hadn't felt beforehand. So it felt really good in that way, but it's very easy to get swept up in it because, um, you know, I've ended up spending all day, every day talking on YouTube, writing articles, doing this sort of stuff. And um, yeah, learned the hard way to force myself to take breaks. But in Scientology, it's so focused on like working all day, every day, because you're judged on your productivity, you're giving a given a statistic and you know for example when you join the sea organization you work seven days a week like 
work, 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 work. So it's taken a lot to kind of realise that no, it's okay <coughs> to take a day off or an evening off or you know sleep in or whatever. Um, so that's been quite hard, but it's been good. It's felt so fulfilling now being in a position where I can help people out when I helped people in in the first place. If that makes sense. Does that answer your question? Any here, I'll travel around the room. Yeah. Hi, um, we actually live in East Grinstead, very near St. Are you a Scientologist? No, we're okay. not. Damn we, it. We, we, <laughs> we live next door to a couple of Scientologists. Okay. Um, but we, we also live very near to some staff accommodation and we see... Walsh Manor, Cobra. Sorry? Walsh Manor in Cobra? No, it's um, it's actually in East Winter, it's on Turner's Hill Road. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And we see these people sort of trotting up every morning to St. Hill, and we just yeah. wonder, what do they do there? Yeah, exactly. And it's, a, it's a massive building, it's beautiful, the grounds look mm. amazing. Well, what do they all do? Yeah, a whole lot of nothing. <laughs> I mean, when you when you sign your seal contract, you're dedicated. You know, if you're like a monk or a nun in like a Christian faith, right? You spend all day every day working for your church. But there comes a point when you're allowed to retire. You know, you get a pension. <laughs> You know, mo most people who are in old age, the former nuns, continue working for their church, but ultimately they're given a pension and say, here we go, thank you for your kind work. But in Scientology, it's not like that because you're an immortal spiritual being. If you signed a one billion year contract, if you're on your deathbed, you could be stuffing letters, still promo pieces to set, you're gonna be doing that. You don't get a pension, you don't get retirement, you're working until the day you die because you're just dropping your body and then you're gonna pick up a new body and then you're gonna carry on working for the church. That's the belief. So in terms of what they're doing, anything and everything, you know, St. Hill is the UK headquarters. So there'll be the Office of Special Affairs, Graham Wilson and Janet Laveau, who were the head of the OSA department who are running the campaign to try and destroy my life. They're based at that property on Turners Hill Road that you just mentioned. You know, there's auditors there. It's kind of, they're trying to get people up the bridge. There's a part of St. Hill Castle where they learn about Xenu, the alien galactic warlord who dropped H-bombs in volcanoes 75 million years ago. Uh, apparently, actually, <laughs> turns out those volcanoes didn't actually exist back then. If you look at the history and geography of the world and all of that, which just makes it even funnier. But no, all of that stuff is happening at St. Hill. And every year in October, there's the International Association of Scientologists event. I was there in November, just gone, and organized the largest protest the UK had seen in 15 years. It was in The Guardian and all that sort of stuff. Probably saw us if you drove past. We, yeah, that was quite funny, actually. Scientology claimed that we caused all this traffic and stopped people from getting their COVID jabs and all of this. It wasn't us, it was them. They had really bad traffic management. But um, yeah, they do everything there. They run the whole UK operation from St. Hill. Um, and there'll be everyone working there from pulling weeds and plants right through to you know high level auditing and executives. But ultimately, there's a lot of abuse and harm that goes on there as well. Mike Rinder, who used to be the uh, international spokesperson, writes in his book about being thrown in the lake at St. Hill in the winter time as punishment. Um, you know, the RPF is the Rehabilitation Project Force. That's their punishment hard labor camp. It's one of those at St. Hill. There are children who are now adults that speak about being raped and abused as children at St. Hill. And that's one of the things that I'm trying to really expose is say, look, you might not know it, but this is happening right here, right now behind those closed doors. And you can be okay with it, but I'm not. Come around the room. Over here, sir. Um, hi. Hi. Thanks for that, which was really interesting. I was curious, you started very young mm. and you were promoted to director of book sales. Public book sales, yeah. What sort of age were you then? And is that typical of when people get promoted into these jobs? Yeah, because in Scientology, there's no concept of age, right? You're an immortal <laughs> spiritual being. So, you know, you might be 12, you know, in your body, but you've lived for the same age as everybody else here, right? And that's how they justify things like child rape and child abuse. Because, you know, yes, your body might be 12 years old, but actually you're you know, an immortal spiritual being. So, yeah, it's very common for children to work for the church and be given grand titles and be in charge of things. For me, as a teenager, it was great. I was like, oh, great, these people are kind of like listening to me and giving me responsibilities and, you know, thinking that I can play some important role in, you know, getting this mission and message out to people. So it was very good for your ego, but um, ultimately it's, it's damaging. But yeah, very typical. Who's next? 
why Alex, um, so you mentioned the tech. Yes. And how it doesn't work, or well, it didn't work for you, but it's supposed to work 100% of the time. So what other examples of the tech could you um, give us? Yeah, so this is one thing I want to make really clear as well, is that like I have no issue with people being Scientologists. Like, if you want to believe in Scientology and practice it, go ahead, like, be my guest. I might disagree with you, but you know that's not my job to judge what is a legitimate and, and an illegitimate belief system i personally think it's harmful in and of itself but what i'm sort of pra- focusing on is really the practice of certain things like fair game you know child manual labor and punishment and that's abusive and that's the stuff that i'm really focusing on trying to stop um in terms of what scientology tech is about i mean there's you know I didn't even get all the way up to the bridge is something the bridge to total freedom is like these courses you do the levels of Scientology they cost millions of dollars and people spend their whole life you know learning about this stuff right so we could be here for hours and hours but ultimately there's life improvement courses learning how to communicate with different people how to fix a marriage or how to manage your finances these are all sort of courses that you do at the very beginning levels of Scientology that get you in and the whole point is it gives you practical tools and tips and think, oh, cool, try doing this or thinking about it in this way, and that might help you. Mm-hmm. And ultimately you go, oh, great, yeah, that's fine. But then as you get further up the bridge, you end up learning about Xenu and all of this other stuff, and it mm-hmm. starts getting really kooky and wild. So, yeah, there's a lot there. But ultimately, you can find help and you can find those answers elsewhere. And uh, I would advise you not to walk into Chapter Scientology <laughs> to find out. <laughs> <laughs> is it... Is it true that um, women who are pregnant and having children have to give up their babies and they go to some kind of orphanage and have to be brought up by other Scientologists? Yeah, even worse than that, there are multiple occasions of forced abortions because if you have joined the Sea Organisation <laughs> and you're dedicating your whole life to work for Scientology, <coughs> if you then become pregnant, then that's a distraction, right? You, how can you continue working for the church and dedicating your whole life to Scientology if you have to raise a kid. So again, they don't force you to have an abortion, but if you don't have an abortion, then you're gonna have to leave the Sea Org. And if you leave the Sea Org, that means breaking your contract, which means you have to pay back for um, the money for all of the courses and everything that you got for free. And remember, they're paying you 50 pounds or in America, $50 a week. So if you've been in the SEAL for 20 years, it's not like you have savings or anything to fall back on. So it's the outside world, the prospect is quite scary, right? So yeah, they don't force you to have an abortion, but it's not really a choice because it would mean giving up your faith, giving up your partner, giving up everything that you know and love. So yeah, they'll take you to the abortion clinic and, and help you through that process is how they'll uh, describe it. Karen, I'm traveling around here. I will come back. Thank you, Alex. And I wonder if you could say something about the finances of the organisation. <laughs> if, if people are paying for courses, mm. I wonder where the money comes in ultimately for them to pay for them. Yeah. And where the, we, we hear all kinds of things about Ron Hubbard. Mm-hmm. So it'd be nice to know something about that too. So, excellent question. Again, I could be here for hours talking about that. Scientology is a, a, a fraud, um, a very fraudulent money-making scam. It has been found guilty of organized fraud on multiple occasions in France, in Hungary. There was just a ruling recently where they you know, realized there was fraud going on. The chase wave is something I'd advise you to Google. This is a sales tactic that we used to use in London Org. Very great idea, but very illegal. Um, if you were to wanting to buy a course, right, in Scientology that costs a thousand pounds, but you didn't have a thousand pounds, right? Well, okay, well, let's figure out how we can get you a thousand pounds to pay for the course. And people in Scientology realize that if you apply for a credit card for a thousand pounds and then very quickly apply for another one and then another one uh, before it goes through on the big banking system, then you end up getting three thousand pounds in credit when you should only really get one because you're being quicker than the system. So they figured out this way of kind of getting you all this credit. They'll force you to, you know, remortgage your home or any other way that you can possibly get your hands on any money whatsoever to pay for these courses. And the whole point is money is, what's the point of money? You know, this is your spiritual freedom here. You're helping the planet, you're helping everybody, you're helping yourself. So who cares if you end up in, you know, quarter of a million pounds debt this lifetime, because the next lifetime, you'll have all these skills and everything you've learned in Scientology and you'll be up the bridge and, you know, whatever, like that's the thinking. Um, In terms of Scientology itself, yeah, there is a lot of 
fraud and movements of money going around. Um, on my blog, Scientology Business, I actually got all of their accounts for the last 10, 15 years of the UK Scientology organization. And they're currently $100 million in debt because they borrow money from the US. And the reason they do that is Scientology is not considered a charity in the UK. They applied for tax exemption in 1999 and were rejected because we have a public benefits test in the UK. So if you want to, if you say you're a religion, they you have to prove that you're benefiting people in practicing that religion. And the charity commission said, you don't benefit the public. So they were rejected charity status, which means they have to pay tax on their um, well, the corporation tax, so tax on their income. So it's in their best interest to show that they're making the least amount of profit in the UK as possible. So what they do is they take out a loan from the US Church of Scientology that they can then pay back in a convenient amount that means that they've made no profit because they have to pay back this huge loan. So yeah, they're $100 million in debt and they keep borrowing more and the whole thing is a big money movement scam. There's also things like property. There's a property in East Grinstead that they purchased through a shell company and then sold it back to the church at like half the price again on top of it. And then they leased it back to that company. And suddenly in the course of 24 hours, this one million pound property was worth like five million pounds and then they're paying rent for it. And it's all very dodgy like that. So there's a lot of movements and money going around um, and it's very questionable, but they're very good at like treading very close to the line and not quite doing anything illegal, but questionable, certainly. Does that answer your question? Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Hi, Alex. Hi. Um, Narcanon, applying yes. scholastics. Yes. And um, would you like to talk about some of the other faces of Scientology? Yeah, so these are the front groups that Scientology have. I don't know if you guys saw on The Guardian or The Observer recently, the front page news. I've been working with Shanti Das, who's a journalist at the, the Guardian since May of last year. About 10 months, we were trying to expose the drug rehabilitation center in Sussex, just up the road. Narconon is a drug rehab center that is based entirely on L. Ron Hubbard's belief that you, when you do drugs, you know, whether that be paracetamol or ibuprofen, they're stored in the fatty tissue of your body forever. And by taking lots of niacin, which is a vitamin, and sitting in a sauna for five, six, seven, if not more hours a day, you will sweat the toxins out and feel great. Uh, there's no science behind that whatsoever. He made it up on an LSD trip on a ship in the Atlantic. <laughs> but that's what Narconon do, and they do it here in the UK. They are a charity because they are supposedly benefiting the public. But one thing that we uncovered last year was that the CQC, the Care Quality Commission, um, had rated them good, but they hadn't actually inspected the drug rehab program itself. So we kicked up a bit of a fuss and it was front page news the other day and the CQC said, well, they're an alternative therapy, it's not a medical intervention. So therefore it's none of our, none of our business, not our problem. Turns out, I think there were 14 complaints filed against, against Narconon over the last couple of years. One of which back in December said that Narconon was putting people at Im imminent uh, risk of harm and abuse because people died from doing this program over in the States a few years ago. So we're kicking on big fuss and saying, look, if the CQC aren't responsible for looking into it, who is, right? And the Charity Commission are now investigating and um, I'm going to continue that work um, to help them do that investigation. And it's the same for Applied Scholastics, Greenfields, the school in East Grinstead that's run by the Church of Scientology. There's also the Criminon program, which is their um, jail, you know, prison inmate rehabilitation through the way to happiness. Um, there's all sorts of stuff like that going on. And it's all a big ploy to get people into Scientology. All right. Carry on this way. Over here. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry, Alex, about your early experiences. It's all right. I'm here now. Just make a wee statement before Go for I it. ask a question. Um, I read up on the L. Ron Hubbard quite a bit and actually had the test in New Zealand many, years, many, many years ago. And it was quite obvious to me that this science fiction writer was a mock messiah, a hubristic and um, narcissistic wiseacre crackpot who wanted money, sex with underage girls, and power. Now, my question is, I understand how you were sucked in, you know, don't get me wrong, but I immediately realised what it was. It was like a lot of organised religions, they're looking for money from people, mm -hmm. and uh, as, as you've heard, it's, this is what, what it's all about. Mm -hmm. Money, 
power and control. Yeah. Am I wrong? Yeah. Now, can I ask a question? <laughs> How many scientists, Scientologists are there in the world? Is it about 60,000? So Scientology claim they've got millions of members worldwide. Um, at the last count, I think they said they've got 100 million or something like that. It's absolute bollocks. Um, if you look in the UK, for example, 10 years ago, they claimed to have 123,000 members in the UK. But the last census, um, which is 2021, showed there are about 1,800 Scientologists here in the UK. Worldwide, the kind of estimates that people who are kind of currently leaving, like there's a whole working out of roughly what's realistically the number, and the most generous estimate is about 30,000 worldwide. So there's not a lot of them, but they have a lot of money, they have a lot of power, and they have a lot of influence. And that's what's shown in East Grinstead Town Council. The mayor uh, last month or a couple months ago said that Scientology are a large and valued part of the town, and that's why we support them. That's well, back by yeah, well, a large and valued part of the town, it turns out 0.18% of the local population is Scientologists. So I presented him with those facts, and he said, stop talking about it. Um, so yeah, they they come across like there's lots of them and they have a lot of power, but there's not really that many of them at all. Is that all right? Hi. Hi. Um, do the people at the very top know that it's a load of cobblers and they're just common people? Mm. And what's the incentive for people who are already fabulously wealthy and famous like John Travolta? Yeah. Um, who don't really, what, what do they gain out of it? Or are, are, that's a really good question and it's hard to answer that because you know I was I was never at the top so I can't speak from personal experience but from people that I do know who have come out of Scientology that worked very closely with Dave Miscavige uh, Mitch Brisker is one of them he was the film director that made those films that I showed uh, you earlier he's now out of the church hilarious conversation when I told him that he was the reason I got sucked in he said thanks mate um, but he is, was very close to Dave Miscavige and he said that he fully believes that Dave Miscavige and those at the top do fully believe in what they're doing um, you've got to remember Dave Miscavige has complete power and control over people's lives so um, he surrounds himself in an echo chamber of yes people right if you say no or you disagree then you're put in the hole you're forced to do hard manual labor for hours on end for years to repent you have to write up your wrongdoings your transgressions you're forced you're interrogated you're locked in a room so you just say yes to whatever he wants or whatever he says so he then fuel it fuels him to be in this big ego trip if he's the big man that's in in control and what he's doing is right and so i think and a lot of people do believe that he does believe in in what he's doing um you know, but I, I don't know, I might be completely wrong. In terms of the celebrities and what they get out of it, number one thing in Scientology in the US is tax exempt. So by donating to the church in America, you can wipe that off your taxes because their tax system is a little bit different here in the UK. So there's a huge financialist incentive. But also in auditing sessions, they write down uh, everything and anything about your life, right? They completely um, control you. They have all your deepest, darkest secrets, your confessions, because they're like therapy sessions. So, you know, it's meant to be protected by priest penitence privilege. But if you try and leave, they'll hold that all against you. So there's a threat there as well. Why would you leave when you know that all of your sexual fantasies from 20 years ago are going to be put up on a hate website and everyone's going to know everything that you don't want the world to know about? So there's a threat there. But there's also just the promise and the hope, right? You know, Scientology's helped this person, Tom Cruise, John Travolta, for their whole life, and they're happy and they haven't seen any abuse because Scientology will desperately try and hide that abuse from them. So why would they want to leave? That's kind of what I would say. Yeah. There's some, peop here, some people over here that have been waiting a while. Hi, Alex. Um, Hi. Can I ask a much more personal question rather than a general one about the hmm. church? And I'm sure we'd all fully understand if you don't want to answer. Go for it. Um, early in your talk, you mentioned your mother and obviously your school friends, <laughs> and later the disconnection of people going into the church. Um, did you disconnect the family and friends? And if you did since leaving, have you been able to reconnect? Yeah, great question. So very close. I mean, I signed my SEAL contract and I was on what's called a project prepare to go and arrive in the SEAL organization at FLAG. So as a 17 year old, I was fully prepared to 
go and move to Florida to work for the church full time and do that for the rest of my life. Um, and before you're allowed to arrive in the Sea Org, you have to be, um, you, know, you have to work out any potential issues that might get in the way later on. So there was a whole plan and a program to kind of not get my mum to be a Scientologist, but to get her to be okay with the fact that her son just, son just signed this one billion year contract and is gonna move abroad, um, which she wasn't greatly pleased about. Um, but they definitely put the wedge in there and it was starting to get to the point where I would have to choose to disconnect from my mum or not join the C organization. Um, it was getting close to that, but luckily I got kicked out before uh, before we got there but in terms of friends and stuff yeah I mean it, it consumes your whole life so when I left Scientology from start you know it was I didn't have anyone didn't know anyone because a I'd moved around a lot as a kid so I didn't really have any friends anyway and secondly everyone and everything that I knew and subscribed to was Scientology and I suddenly kicked out so luckily age wise I was you know 18 so I just started university so I was able to kind of throw myself into something else and meet more people but but yeah, it's hard. Thank you. That's right. Yeah, Is there anyone that hasn't asked a question? There yet? are some people just, here who wait, uh, wait very early just, on. Just take one here and then I'll be back. Yeah, hello. Hi. Thank you. Um, one question is how much is that legally enforceable uh, if they ask people to pay stuff back? Mm. And can you sue them if they actually publish stuff that is personal? Mm. Absolutely. Great question. Um, and it's really hard because the UK and US laws are very different and there haven't been that many case studies in the UK. So it's kind of a bit of speculation. In terms of the billion year contract, that's absolutely not legally enforceable. It's a spiritual commitment and it would never stand up in a court of law. Um, in terms of defamation and libel and harassment, all that sort of thing, I spoke to my lawyer the other day who was saying that whatever lawsuit that's ever brought against Scientology in the UK, they would have a really tough time uh, claiming things like defamation. So it kind of gives people a free roam to say what they want about Scientology, because in order for Scientology to prove that their reputation has been damaged by whatever you've said, they have to prove they have a reputation in the first place, which Scientology wouldn't <laughs> be able to do in the UK. Um, so they're kind of, you know, you're kind of protected in that sense. In terms of your personal information out there on the internet and whatever they choose to do to destroy your life. The only case study that I can think of that I'm aware of is Bonnie Woods, who lives just down the road actually. Um, and she sued the church in the early 2000s because they sent private investigators to follow her and you know, were making up these horrible things about her. This was kind of before the internet it was really a big thing for them with websites and stuff. She sued them for harassment and won um, and they paid her a lump sum of money and issued her a formal apology. Um, and so they're a little bit more scared to do that now, but who knows, you probably would have a case, yes, but ask a legal professional, it's not me. <laughs> do they call them past eight squirrels? Nick Mike. <laughs> um, I, thanks again. Um, I've got another slightly personal question. So Go for it. We talk about it as a high control organisation which mm -hmm. puts it on a continuum. Mm -hmm. We talk about how unfeasible the beliefs in Zeno and things are. And, then, and again, there's, there's a continuum of feasible beliefs in organisations. What's your relationship with religion more generally been mm. before and since your experience? Mm. So I've never really been like a massively religious person. I mean, I went to five schools, two of which were um, religious schools. I went to a Church of England primary school. One of the secondary schools I went to is a Catholic school. The only reason was they were local and had good results. It's not because I subscribed to the religious belief. Um, I did realize as a, a teenager that if I went up and pretended to be Catholic and gave a reading at their you know, service on Wednesday morning, it meant I get to skip, the, skip class for an hour or two. So I did that quite a lot, but only because I wanted to skip class and not because I was religious in any way. And then since leaving Scientology, I've not really had any headspace to think about that sort of thing. You know, I believe that, you know, we'll figure it out. We're all here. I'm quite nihilistic. There's not really a point in living. There's not like a greater God that's like, this is your purpose and this is why you're here. But not in like a negative, what's the point kind of way, just in a, we're here and we've got to do what we can to make our life worth living and be happy day to day, right? So that's kind of where I'm focusing at the moment. But. Um, yeah, I haven't really massively explored different religions. That wasn't a big thing for me. And what about your attitude to the organisations that run? So what do I think about different 
religious groups. I mean, look, I think people are free to believe in what they want. And there's a big question there about religious belief versus the organizations that run those belief systems. And ultimately, I think you're free to believe in what you want. Um, and with any big group that organizes anyone's belief, there's going to be corruption, all of those things that you see. The difference with Scientology is that it's, um, it's a cult, right? It's not just a, you can choose to believe this and it might help you, it might not. You're free to leave at any time. No, it's a totalitarian extremist belief system and it's harmful in its practice, in its nature. So it's kind of not just about how it's run or the organization, it's about the actual thing itself being destructive, um, in my opinion. Um, but it's kind of a different set of kind of criteria to a religious belief because it's, it's a cult, it's a slightly different thing. We've got time for two more questions. Anyone that has an answer? Gentleman here, and then we'll come over to you at the end there. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering, just uh, based on what you were saying, how long do you think Scientology will exist for, and what do you think it might end it? Um, so, uh, Scientology is going to be around longer than humans, unfortunately, because one of the things <laughs> that Scientology have done is spent millions of dollars building several nuclear-proof bunkers in various locations around the world that are built to withstand direct nuclear strikes. The teachings of Elron Hubbard have been engraved on gold plates in sealed titanium boxes filled with argon gas. They are built to withstand anything and everything. So unfortunately, Scientology is going to be here, whether you like it or not, forever. Um, whether or not people are going to be practicing that uh, and whether or not there'll be an organization of Scientology is another question. Um, one of the big things is their tax exempt status in the US is hugely important because in the US you have freedom of religion, it's protected by the First Amendment, all this sort of stuff. So by having tax exemption there, they're very protected because lawyers and judges don't want to rule on their beliefs because that's separation of church and state is a big problem. So that's a big thing. And as soon as their tax exemption is removed, that opens the door for their operations to be examined in a, a new way. Um, so a lot of people believe that once their tax exemption is revoked, that will be the catalyst for a very short downfall of Scientology. But, you know, it's been around since the 1950s. It's not going anywhere anytime soon. I do think that we are towards the end because more and more people are speaking out about it. We have the internet now, so it's very easy for people like me to jump on YouTube and start speaking about my experiences and other people to find out about it. And so it's a lot harder for them to grow and get in new people. They are shrinking at a rate of knots. Someone gave me some stats recently from one, like Inside Scientology and it, the stats from when I was on staffed where they are now, it's been a 33% decrease since when I was in 10 years ago in the UK. So they are shrinking. They are towards the end, but who knows? Hopefully in our lifetime. It was just really quickly, just more about the celebrity annex. I just wanted to point out that people like Tom Cruise and John Travolta don't see the abuses going on, do they? Yeah, exactly. It's hidden. So as a celebrity, you're given the red carpet treatment. You're like, you know, the most important person in the room. You know, you've donated millions of dollars. So, of course, they're going to do anything and everything they possibly can to make sure that you don't see, you know, the people in the hole which is the hard manual labor camp that I was talking about earlier. So all of these big celebrities and big supporters of Scientology that you see walking around, the mayor of East Grinstead, for example, he's not a Scientologist, but he doesn't see the abuse, right? All he sees is the Scientologists going up to him and being really friendly and giving him checks and being like, oh, Scientology is great. You know, here's some cucumber sandwiches and, you know, all of that sort of stuff it makes the person feel great he doesn't see the abuse and he won't ever see the abuse so that's part of the drive in what i'm doing now is kind of raising awareness that you don't even realize that this is going on and that's why it's important because they're very good at hiding it um, and they have an answer for everything um to try and convince you that it's not what it seems but it is don't join scientology yeah no that's a really good question that's a really good one to end it on actually um, so like what can you do to stop it i mean look there's if there was an answer that i could give you right now i wouldn't be here because we would have done it right but you know just kind of 
I suppose, help raise awareness, you know, like I've got a YouTube channel. There are dozens of people on YouTube speaking out about their experiences. Go give them a follow, um, you know, give them a subscribe and a comment, all that sort of stuff, because the more engagement and stuff there is online and the more you talk about it in real, the real world with your friends and family, the more people know about it and therefore the more people hopefully we can get out. Word of mouth is the most important thing. Um, write to your local MP. Um, I did that recently. Diane Abbott is my local MP, lover or hater. Um, she did write to HMRC and request an investigation into Scientology's finances for fraud. I'm working with her very closely to try and get the government to look at Scientology's operation and that's gonna need the support of more MPs. So if you write to your local MP and say, hey, I'm just concerned about Scientology, you know, can you, can you help you know, do something about it, you know, you don't need to be that specific, then your MP is obligated to do that because uh, you're representative. So all that sort of stuff's really important. And support the Aftermath Foundation, which is a charity that exists to help people escape and leave Scientology. If you go to theaftermathfoundation.org, theaftermathfoundation.org, yeah, they'll take your donations and they help people escape and leave. So wherever you are in the world, if you're a Scientologist and you call them up and they say, hey, I need help leaving Scientology, I'm, I'm done, they'll come and pick you up wherever you are and they'll mm. take you and house you and all that sort of now, stuff. Are you worried? Sorry, it's a question. Are you, are you worried given you're their number one? Yeah, I mean, look, that, a lot of people ask me that and the thing is if I was worried or shaken or stirred about by what they're doing, then I wouldn't stand a chance because I know that what they're trying to do is intimidate me and scare me and following me. I've got private investigators sitting outside my house most mornings. I've got, you know, people tweeting me every single day about how I'm this and that and the other. If that bothered me, there's no way I'd be able to take them on, like, because I just know, I, you know, you can't let that rattle you. And ultimately nowadays, if you have a hate website about you that says, I don't have one just yet, but I'm sure it's only a matter of time, um, where it says you're this and you're that and you're a child rapist and abuser and blah, blah, blah. Like people look at that and they know that it's Scientology and they know that it's all rubbish nowadays. That wasn't the case 20 years ago. Um, so no, I'm not bothered by it because any sort of shit that they throw my way is worth it because what I'm doing is helping the people who are suffering from abuse right now. So it's a small price to pay, in my opinion. Yeah. Thank you, Thank you very much. much. Is that all right? Thank you, everybody.